Hello, everybody, and welcome to my talk on modeling the impact of depth on pointing performance. I'm Isabel, and I'm just going to get straight into this. So, um, what are we studying, and why are we studying it? Um, in this paper, we studied specifically uh, distal pointing. Basically, you're standing in front of the screen a certain distance away. You have a pointer in your hand. Maybe there's a VR or a computer vision system tracking your uh, hand as well, um, and you're projecting a ray from the hand to the screen to position the cursor like a laser pointer. Um, a lot of the motivation for this paper in particular comes from previous work in our lab um, uh, investigating distal pointing, um, Garcia Maker et al. Um, but where does this connect with VR? Um, so specifically, um, one of the key findings that Garth had in his uh, work was that um, with certain uh, models of pointing, you could tell uh, physical parameters of the pointing being done based on their performance. Uh, specifically, you could tell how sensitive that system was, what gain settings were like. Um, and we had the question, could we use this to tell uh, how far away people were from the screen in a distal interaction? Could we use this to perhaps calibrate a VR system through performance rather than self-report or measuring of you know, interpupillary distance? Um, that being said, um, we're reporting these main contributions in our paper. Um, so we provide further evidence that two-part models of pointing performance are necessary in some situations. Um, we note that the effect of gain and depth are very similar on distal pointing. Um, we provide some evidence to suggest that angular measures of target difficulty are not um, improving distal pointing models much. Um, and Shoemaker's k-factor, which I'll talk about later, um, may help us uh, measure VR calibration. So of course, fundamental to the discussion is how do we model pointing performance? Um, most people are probably fairly familiar with this. Pitt's law uses um, the ratio of amplitude, the size of the tar or the distance between the targets, um, and width, the size of the, the size of the targets, um, to predict movement time. Shannon Fitz adds a plus one to improve intercepts and improve the information theoretic understanding. And Welford's separates them out into two separate terms that give amplitude and width separate <coughs> impacts, basically arguing that the distance between the target and the size the, about the target um, matter to a different extent. Um, Shannon Welford is just Shannon, but two part. So that k factor I was talking about, um, the Welford's model has two parameters um, or two coefficients. Um, each describing the impact of amplitude and width. Um, K is the ratio of the two. It just describes the relative impact of these two on uh, pointing performance. Um, so this graph on the left is from Shoemaker's work, um, showing essentially that K varies very linearly with gain. Um, you, make, um, you make the mouse more and more sensitive, the bigger and bigger K gets. Um, and we have the observation that um, in the uh, example on the right, um, with the VR setup, you made a physical movement, on the close screen, um, you have some certain horizontal uh, output uh, translation, but on the further, far screen, that output translation is a lot farther. That intersection occurs much more. And sort of this is the classical definition of the control display ratio, the amount of physical movement to output virtual movement. Um, so we think that this might have the same impact as gain. Um, angular measures. Um, a couple of people had kind of noticed some problems modeling distal pointing applications, um, and this is sort of... Uh, an attempt to address this, and basically what they want to do is put uh, distance from the screen as a uh, parameter in your pointing model. Um, they saw rather dramatic improvements from like 0.7 R squared to like 0.95 R squared, um, but we noted that mathematically their model, um, they, they suggested with some other changes that makes it more similar to two-part models, which already improve pointing performance. So we wanted to test whether or not um, their angular metrics were improving their data, or whether or not it was Welford's. Um, whether or not they just they're, they're, com they're comparing apples to oranges, really. Um, so that's a lot of the background. Um, the main research questions we had in our user study are as follows. Um, do two-part models of pointing performance more robustly model pointing? Um, do, is using angular index of difficulty sufficient for us to just keep using our standard simple one-part models that everybody seems to like a lot? Um, does k vary in a similar way to gain? Um, is it a monotonic linear relationship? And um, also, is this variation the same for uh, changes in virtual depth as physical depth? Um, so the apparatus, fairly simple, um, that we used to study this. It's an active stereo environment. There's a couple of Icon cameras around the room doing hand tracking um, and head tracking. There's a button in the left hand to select the targets. Um, we chose a more fundamental 1D sort of pointing task, you know, subtask to all sorts of other more complex interactions to study. Um, so the study design um, that we used um, is sort of a little bit interesting. Um, we stood people at different physical distances from the screen. So you're standing at 110, 220, or 330 centimeters. Um, and then we model pointing with three amplitudes and three widths. Um, then um, we would use VR to try and simulate the other conditions. So we would have VR to try and simulate 220 centimeters away when you're actually standing 110. Um, and we want to compare and see these uh, if these are the same. 
Um, also, we were doing um, a model of pointing that was trying to uh, capture multiple depths at once, which is the global model and the best case for angular metrics. Um, in terms of um, sort of uh, results, I'm going to go uh, through at a fairly high level in this presentation. Um, a lot of the uh, more details are sort of in the paper if you're really interested in them. I'm just going to kind of go through our questions sort of one by one. So for the question of does a two-part model uh, more robustly model pointing performance? Um, we found uh, sort of a trend where when you were really close to the screen at the 110 centimeter condition, um, you really didn't notice any difference between sort of one part and two part models. So the, the purple and green lines are two part, the red and blue are one part. As you got further away from the screen, um, uh, Welford style models started pulling ahead more and more. Um, there's also an important sort of programming note here. Welford's is a special case of Fitts law. Um, because if k is exactly equal to one, mathematically the same model, which means um, you can run a nested ANOVA uh, statistical test to see if the difference is statistically significant given the increase in degrees of freedom. Because, of course, um, adding more degrees of freedom into your model, you're going to see an improvement regardless, even if that's not reflective of the data. So, um, ah. um, so we ran the uh, statistical ANOVA on um, the conditions, and the, the highlighted ones are statistically significant. Um, how do we understand this, though? Um, so there is this um, graph that we've drawn a couple times. Um, basically, the points on the left and right graphs are exactly identical. All that changes is what lines are drawn through which points. Um, so on one graph, uh, we keep amplitude the same and then vary width to change the difficulty, and we get some output movement time. And on the other one, we keep width the same and change amplitude. Um, what we notice is that there's different slopes. Um, so if you uh, are only varying width or if you're only varying amplitude, you get different sort of output impacts on movement time. Um, now, it's important to note, this is for the 330 distance condition. This is where Fitz and Welford um, were sort of starting to diverge. Um, so this is where they had a separable impact. Um, we also can sort of understand this um, in terms of sort of the K parameter. Um, uh, basically, um, we wanted to figure out how the K varied with gain, um, but one of the impacts of this is um, when you were really close to the screen, K was about 1. Um, so through just happenstance, um, in that one condition, um, the impacts of A and W were about the same, um, and thus mathematically Fitz and Welford were the same model, and who cares? Um, as we got further away, um, we started seeing um, greater and greater um, Ks. Um, now, having said that, one of our questions was linearity. Um, this is sort of a limitation of our study design for future work that uh, you need more data points than three to prove a linear relationship. Um, so we are planning and have already run sort of a future study, but that's just not included in this write-up. Um, so, um, what next? We also had this question of whether or not um, is this K variation the same for virtual depth as it is for um, physical depth? Um, sort of. The blue line is ground truth, so you don't have any stereo interfering with you there. Um, however, um, all the other lines are you're standing at a set physical distance, and we uh, simulate the other conditions with virtual um, reality. Um, we find that the blue line was like uh, a lower slope. The other lines seem to be more extreme. Um, also, the intercepts were a little bit crazy in some of them. Um, so what we were kind of gleaning from that is maybe this VR system, which we did use a fixed parameter adjustment through uh, calibration on an individual participant basis. Um, maybe there was um, sort of sweet spots where if you move too far away and all of a sudden it's not uh, working quite as well. Um, it could be that there's a fundamental problem with some aspects of VR because we know it's not perfect. There is the focus convergent conf conflict. So maybe um, it's just a fundamental problem and we have to kind of deal with it. Um, now, one of our sort of high level goals was trying to get, in get into sort of a really sort of accurate calibration that you could put in a system and then it adjusts sort of like what, what they were doing. Um, we're not sure if this data is um, clean enough yet. Um, so uh, the problem could be that there's multiple factors impacting K. I mean, who knows? How many cups of coffee you have that day might impact uh, how sensitive you're doing. Um, so um, it's really hard to sort of say that this is a super clean relationship. But it could be a really good like rough estimate. Are our performance metrics kind of lining up with sort of the virtual system that we're trying to do? And again, a lot of future work to investigate there. Um, we also have that question of whether or not you could just use um, angular metrics of uh, dip, uh, target difficulty to improve your one-part models. Um, this was really kind of interesting and surprising to us. 
Um, we tried just using a standard fits one part model um, and just plugging in the amplitudes and widths and, and angles, and we literally had to round off the changes in R squared. You saw some changes in sort of the exact values of um, the uh, sort of uh, coefficients, um, but they were really modeling sort of the same data. You're getting the same results out of them either way. Um, now, having said that, for specific uh, distances, that's not surprising, right? It's supposed to uh, try and model multiple distances at once. Um, we ran the global um, condition, um, and for Fitz, uh, for Shannon, for Welford, we saw really no difference still. We saw like maybe like 0.1 or 0.01 um, or something. Um, for global Shannon, for some re or for global Shannon Welford, for some reason we saw an improvement from 0.92 to 0.96. Even still, that's nothing like what Copper was seeing. Copper was seeing like changes from like 0.7 to 0.95, which we did not see at all. Um, so we just really didn't find that much support for that sort of idea. Um, now, um, it, this doesn't necessarily mean that we've conclusively found that angular measures are completely, you know, not helpful. Um, of course, there was that one improvement in global, um, and maybe sort of a more tightly controlled experiment can find something. Um, we're just reporting that we didn't really see any improvement here. Um, so, um, going through sort of our research questions, sort of like one by one, in high level summary. Um, so, do two-part models more robustly model pointing performance? Um, yes, we found that. Um, it's important to note here that we're not arguing that standard fits law, one-part models suck and we should all go away from them. No. Um, what we're arguing is that there are special cases that happen a lot in VR um, where you might consider swapping to a two-part model pointing performance. Um, it's not that one-part models are bad, they work really well for desktops, but probably for desktops, you, if you run the test, you'll see K is probably about one, and then who cares? Um, so it's for specific scenarios, maybe it's better. Um, so uh, is using Angular Index a difficulty sufficient to keep using our one-part models? We didn't see so. Um, maybe somebody else will find something different that counters our argument, who knows. Um, for uh, variance of K being similar to gain, um, it seemed to be a, sort of a very monotonic relationship. As you got further away, it got bigger. Same thing with, with gain. Um, we uh, can't conclusively say that it's linear or not. Um, what we kind of noticed is it tailed off a little bit to the end. So it might be that it's linear for some subset, but as you get further and further away, it stops um, getting further. So maybe it's like a linear power relationship. Again, further, further investigation required. Um, is the trend um, the same for changes in virtual depth as physical? Similar, but we don't really know exactly um, which way uh, it's going. Um, so at, I think at best it's probably going to be a rough estimate, um, but it might be helpful if you're having a really critical um, sort of uh, training or simulation um, inter interaction where you really want to be sure that your performance is kind of lining up with real world. Um, now we had, um, unfortunately I was nervous in talking too fast, um, however, we had a couple of key takeaways that we wanted to give um, to the audience um, and sort of pointing practitioners and things in the audience. Um, so when you're doing a pointing evaluation in sort of a distal or VR environment, you really need to consider a sort of depth distance from the screen as something that you're controlling as a factor. Um, if you were running a desktop pointing evaluation with any new interface, you would turn off mouse acceleration. Um, completely, right? Because um, it, it kind of screws with results um, and um, you kind of get inconsistent sort of inconsistent types of interaction. Um, however, um, brain, um, of course in VR, um, you, like, moving around is something that just happens naturally. So you probably want to try and do, in your experiment, have a limited subset um, or try and account for this with sort of a welfare style model or something along those lines. Um, but at limiting as much as possible for experimental consistency is probably a good idea. Um, now, um, we also say um, if you're running into issues where you're doing, you have this fancy new um, interaction style, you spent months of your life on it and thousands of uh, grant money, dollars of grant money on it, um, and your R squares aren't hitting that somewhat arbitrarily selected 0.90 threshold that we all kind of use for whether or not results are good enough to be published, um, try using a welfare model. It could be that these new interfaces and new devices are performing well for select tasks. So it could be that you have a device that's really good for crossing large distances, but doesn't do sort of uh, small little adjustments really well. Um, and sort of that will come out in a welfare style model. Um, so that's a little bit awkward in terms of, um, we all like that throughput as a method of comparing sort of uh, results uh, between studies. Um, but you could, con could conceivably think of like uh, two separate throughputs of amplitude throughput and width throughput to kind of get an idea of something more nuanced of what it is a specific pointing device is good at. 
Um, and uh, we're also going to argue that angular measures are probably a scaling operation. Um, it's still sort of similar, um, like by similar triangles, you're still doing the same sort of angle for farther distance as closer distances. Um, yeah, we, we really don't think they're worth spending a huge amount of time if you're running into problems on. Um, but if somebody else wants to prove us wrong, that's great. Awesome. Research process will work. Um, so also, um, Cave appears to suggest target depth, but really needs to be investigated more thoroughly. Um, we're planning some things. Um, one, one potential explanation we were coming into is maybe this is all just an artifact of latency. So it could be that instead of this being, um, you know, you're, you're physically moving and it's an artifact of the, the, the sensory motor system, it could be that um, just latency is becoming more problematic as you get further away from the screen um, and maybe making it harder to um, select uh, smaller targets or something along those lines. Um, so definitely that needs to be investigated further and we plan to study that what is controlling for latency after this. Um, so thank you very much for all your time. Um, I'd like to thank my advisor, Kelly Booth, um, as well as uh, Vasanth Kumar. Ah, those were cut out. Those, there's extra results. Um, um, as well as Vasant, um, who, okay, whatever. <laughs> uh, Vasant, who worked with us and our funding from Ensark and Brand and all those sorts of things. Um, so I'm open for questions now. Um, Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Um, again, if you have a question, approach the microphone, which has been switched on, say who you are, and then ask a positive question. So my name is Paul Schulmeier. I mm -hmm. I don't have a positive question. Wait, wait, wait. I okay. just have wait, a question. You, wait, 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 I, hang on, hang on. What's I happening? welcome all questions and challenges. <laughs> okay, so my name is Paul Schulmeier. I'm at Copenhagen University, and I'm just a bit. I'm curious about your physical setup. So I'm curious what exactly your participants used to point. And I'm curious about the, um, the visual feedback they got on the cursor. And as okay. the as the wall moved further away. Did you change the visual feedback? So um, the uh, pointing device they used, um, sort of the Vicon wand wave toolkit that we used to um, sort of find the position of um, the object in their hand, um, and Vicons are tracking everything. Um, however, um, because that doesn't have a button attached to it, in their left hand they held a Wii remote um, that was sending to uh, the computer to say when to select it. Um, now in terms of the cursor, um, there was a like uh, infinitely long or infinitely long sort of uh, horizontal cursor because this was a 1D task. Um, that um, it, the cursor itself didn't change, but it was sort of in the plane of the of the interaction there. Um, and they would have feedback when they selected something, whether or not they got it right. So when the wall was further away, the cursor would appear smaller to the participant. Um, it, it, I mean, it would appear slightly smaller, but the, the width was one pixel anyways, um, at, or a couple, it was like two or three pixels, um, and um, it was already infinitely tall, so they wouldn't see sort of the, the ends kind of, kind of come down. Um, so you probably wouldn't really notice it. Um, if, if it, if it, it was there, but it would be a very small change. Okay, cool. That's all I want to know. Thank you. Hi, Miguel Nacenta from uh, University of St. Andrews. Thank you very much for your presentation. I, mm -hmm. I really appreciate that, um, this work. Um, this might be a very stupid question because I might have missed something, but uh, my understanding of angular models versus linear models is like um, is that they're not, um, they're not necessarily incompatible with, with the two-part model. Mm -hmm. um, so are the two-part models not also applicable with an angular approach. To me, the angular model, what, is actually, what it does essentially it corrects for, for these kind of like oblique perspective kind of things that happens when you're very close to display and things <laughs> are happening fairly far yeah. from you. That's actually kind of almost exactly what we found. Um, so in the slide on angular models, I was talking about how we did sort of a global model across multiple depths at once. Um, for that, Fitz Law, didn't see an improvement. Shannon didn't see an improvement. Welford's didn't really see an improvement, but Shannon Welford's, which is sort of Shannon but two part, um, that actually saw the improvement. So um, we did run that, um, and uh, we saw some improvement with two part models, um, but not really enough to convince us of Copper's findings. Like we didn't see the like 20 or 30 percent improvements that he was seeing. Um, so.